Today, we're going to be exploring mystical mandalas. I'm going to share my screen with you. So this image was hand-drawn by H. Spencer Lewis in the 1920s the Rosicrucian order reproduced the secret symbols of the Rosicrucians of the 16th and 17th centuries. And H. Spencer Lewis wanted to make this available to members so that they could focus on these powerful mystical images while they colored them. And we have in the Rosicrucian Research Library at Rosicrucian Park, the original that was colored by H. Spencer Lewis. And we've seen many of these that were colored by other members as a meditation practice. The word mandala means circle in Sanskrit. And it is a a schematized representation of the cosmos, the chiefly, chiefly characterized by a concentric configuration of geometric shapes. And we're going to look at many examples of mandalas. In Jungian psychology, a mandala is a symbol representing the work to reunify the self. And today in common use, Mandala has become a generic term for any diagram, chart, or geometric pattern that represents the cosmos, metaphysically or symbolically, a microcosm of the universe. Carl Jung lived from 1875 to 1961, and you may be familiar with Jung's extensive work, not only as a psychiatrist, but also as a mystic. And he said that a mandala is a graphical representation of the center of the self, the archetype of psychic totality. It can appear in dreams or visions, or it can be spontaneously created as a work of art. In Jungian therapy, which includes a recognition and the conscious integration of the contents of the collective unconscious, the spontaneous drawing of mandalas is required. Jung wrote, my thesis then is as follows. In addition to our immediate consciousness, which is of a thoroughly personal nature, there exists a second psychic system of a collective, universal, and impersonal nature, which is identical in all individuals. This collective unconscious does not develop individually, but is inherited. It consists of pre-existence forms, the archetypes which can only become conscious secondarily and which give definite form to certain psychic contents. This is the first mandala that Carl Jung constructed in the year 1916. And he said later that he was wholly unconscious of what it meant. In November of 1913, Jung began an exploration of the psyche or, or the psyche or the soul. He called it his confrontation with the unconscious. And during this period, he willfully entered imaginative or visionary states of consciousness. And then he carefully recorded these journeys in six black covered journals referred to as the black books. And these notebooks provide a dated chronological ledger of his visions and dialogues with his soul. And we're going to explore many different mandalas during our time together today. Jung said, the self I thought was like the monad, which I am and which is my world. The mandala represents this monad and corresponds to the microcosmic nature of the psyche. In 
In previous teleconferences, I've mentioned an audio recording by Rosicrucian Erwin Watermeyer, who was an RCUI instructor in physics. He was a, an amazing mystic. And we have this audio recording and a transcription of it available online. So if you go to rosicrucian.org, you can find either the audio recording of this, uh, the audio recording of two practical principles. And Erwin Watermeyer describes how we can communicate with the master within. And it's related to what I just shared from Carl Jung. There are two practical principles. The only events of which a person may become object objectively aware are impressions expressed in terms of the five objective senses. So the only way that we can become aware of something is if we see it or smell it or taste it, something to do with the five objective senses. A psychic event must transform and express itself in objective terms in order to be objectively realized. So in order for us to have an experience of a psychic event, it has to be transformed into an objective event through our senses. For example, when we do our Rosicrucian experiments and we're able to see someone's aura, we're not actually seeing the aura with our physical eyes. We are sensing the vibration psychically and then our physical, uh, then our brain transforms this into something objective that our mind can understand. So psychic impressions are transformed into what looks like lights or vibration around an individual. Now, the next practical principle that Erwin Watermeyer describes, if one desires to communicate with the subconscious, the message must first be transformed into a symbol or an image before it may be released. We are all familiar with this principle. It forms the basis of the process of visualization. We know that when we desire to impress any message upon our inner self, we must first visualize this message and all its details and provide it with an emotional charge. The only manner in which our subconscious may receive any impression is in the form of non-words, images, or symbols. The subconscious speaks only the language of the symbol, and it understands only the language of the symbol. Now, this all relates to mandalas. We can approach mandalas in many different ways, and here are a few. We can meditate on images created by us or by others, including gazing upon them, coloring them with markers or pencils, chanting, and other things. We can also learn the meaning of symbols and then meditate on and engage with the images, having that meaning in the back of our mind. And we can open ourselves to creating our own mandalas, which we will do today. How many of you are familiar with Tibetan mandalas that are made out of sand? In the Tibetan mandalas, the mandala represents an imaginary palace that is contemplated during meditation. So these Tibetan, these, these Buddhist monks are meditating while they're creating this mandala, this beautiful, colorful image out of sand. Each object in the palace has significance, representing an aspect of wisdom or reminding the meditator of a guiding principle. The purpose of the mandala is to help transform ordinary minds into enlightened ones and to assist with healing. These Buddhist mandalas also purify the space in which they are created. These often contain deities with the principal deity in the center of the pattern. And the deities who reside in the palace embody philosophical views and serve as role models. 
According to Buddhist scripture, mandalas constructed from sand transmit positive energies to the environment and to the people who view them. So just gazing upon this mandala can have a positive effect on the viewer. They are believed to affect purification and healing. Mandala sand painting was introduced by the Buddha himself. And there are many different designs of mandalas, each with a different lesson to teach. The mandala sand paintings are done in a very ceremonial fashion. The monks enter and it's um, very solemn and uh, again, ceremonial during which lamas consecrate the site and call forth the forces of goodness. And the monks chant and dance in these beautiful, in the beautiful dress. Then they begin their work. So the mandala that you see here, you can see on the edges, it was drawn first just in white, and then it's filled in with sand. And here is how that is done. The monk puts colored sand, one color of sand in this metal holder, the tube, and then taps on the tube and the sand comes out of the pointy end there to the left. So it's practically two or three grains of sand at a time that create these amazing images. You can imagine the focus that this requires, which is part of the meditation. And then when the entire mandala has been created, it is destroyed. And this is important in Buddhist philosophy, the impermanence of life and beauty and of any condition. And this is all done very ceremoniously. And the sand is then returned usually to a river to take the thoughts and the healing out into the world. Native Americans have produced ceremonial mandalas for hundreds and probably thousands of years. You may be familiar especially with Navajo sand paintings. And it's believed that these mandalas, these sand paintings, so this image that you see was also created out of tiny grains of colored sand. And it's believed that these are places where the deities come and go. And this is an image of a sand painting being created. Often they're created for someone who needs healing. And the images that are in the mandala are figures that can help to heal the person or the ideal situation or condition for the person who requires healing. The sand mandalas are ceremonial creations that are almost like a spiritual portrait of the person. And sometimes they're also used at the time of harvest. Typically when the sand mandalas are created, it includes chanting. After the healing ceremony, the sand painting is considered toxic and it's destroyed because it has absorbed the illness or the challenge of the person. More recently though, some sand, sand mandalas are then created into weavings or pottery. If, they're, if they weren't used for the specific purpose of healing a person, then you may have seen these that in more recent years are available for sale. Is anyone familiar with this image? I'll give you a hint. It is a state flag in the United States. And it was created in 1920. Oh, all right. Somebody got it. This is the New Mexico state flag. And in 1920, there was a competition to create a flag for the state of New Mexico. And a physician and archaeologist named Dr. Harry, Harry Mira of Santa Fe created this. The design features an interpretation of an ancient symbol of the sun as they had found on a, a water jar from the Zia Pueblo. And the red is the symbol 
The red symbol is called a Zia and is centered on a field of yellow. For the Zia people, four is the sacred number and can be found repeated in the four points radiating from the circle. So it's divided into four and there are the four lines going each direction. The number four um, represents, of course, the directions, the points of the compass, north, east, south, and west. The four seasons of the year, summer, autumn, winter, and spring. And uh, in the 24 hours of each day, there is sunrise, noon, evening, and night. For the Zia people, the four seasons of life are childhood, youth, adulthood, and old age. And the Zia people also believe that with life came four sacred obligations, development of a strong body, a clear mind, a pure spirit, and devotion to the welfare of others. And all of these things are bound together within the circle of life. So again, this is the current flag of the state of New Mexico. And this isn't without controversy. Some people um, don't appreciate that this sacred image was appropriated for the state flag. And, um, and others believe that it honors this ancient tradition. In the center of this mandala is the word Aum, written in Sanskrit. In English, we would write Aum, A-U-M, but in the very center of this mandala is written in Sanskrit, Aum. Aum is the sacred breath or divine word that began the process of creation. It is a sacred chant in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. In Hinduism, Aum represents Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer. For those of us who are Rosicrucians, we know that Aum is a vowel sound that we often use, and it represents the omniscience, omnipotence, and omnipresence of the divine. And Rosicrucians don't typically meditate on the word Aum, the sound Aum written in Sanskrit. We're going to intone Aum as we look at this mandala again. And many people in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism believe that if you were to completely attune with the symbol that you see here for Aum, that you could achieve instant enlightenment, or if you could intone it in the most perfect way, that you would achieve instant enlightenment. So now we're going to intone the vowel sound Aum seven times while we gaze upon this mandala. And You may find it beneficial at some point in the future to work with this mandala, coloring in the images that are around the center circle. And today we're just going to gently place our gaze on Aum written in Sanskrit in the center while we intone the vowel sound Aum seven times. So please sit in whatever way is most comfortable for you. Take three deep breaths, becoming more relaxed with each exhalation. Now relax your eyes 
You may even feel your vision go slightly out of focus. Your eyelids might close slightly and gaze upon the image in the center of this mandala. Ready, inhale. Ah. Next, we're going to explore Kabbalistic mandalas. In a previous teleconference, we chanted together the Kabbalistic meditation called the 231 Gates. And it's related to the image that you see here. These are the 22 Hebrew letters, which like the figures in Sanskrit are believed to have power within themselves. And just like looking upon Sanskrit, gazing upon letters in Hebrew can have powerful effects on us, especially during meditation. And on this image at the top is the first Hebrew letter, which is Aleph. And then to our left, it's Beit, and then Gimel and Dalat. So this is going counterclockwise. And the lines that you see are connecting every letter with all the other letters. This Kabbalistic meditation is described in the book named Sefer Yetzirah a book on creation, and this is available online for free. This is published by the Rosicrucian Order. It's an ancient text, and it's a meditation manual. If you try to read the Sefer Yetzirah intellectually, you'll set it down in about two minutes because it will be very frustrating. If you approach it as a meditation manual, in my personal experience, it can have very profound effects. And this describes the 231 gates meditation. The Sefer Yitzira says, the divine established 22 letters by the voice, formed by the breath of air, and fixed them on a sphere like a wall with 231 gates. That's the image that we just saw and turn the spheres forward and backward. 
How is it done? He combined, weighed, and changed Aleph with all the other letters in succession. Again, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, around all the other letters. And all the other letters and all the others again with Aleph. Bet with all and again with Bet. And so the whole series of letters. Hence it follows that there are 231 formations and that every creature and every word emanated from one name. If you multiply the 22 Hebrew letters times the other 21 letters, you get 462. And if you divide that by half, creating a gate through which you can enter, that's how you get 231 gates. And we are going to just gaze upon this image for a Aleph few minutes. Bet, Aleph Gimel, Aleph Dalit, Aleph He, Aleph, bet. Aleph Vav, Aleph Zion, Aleph Het, Aleph Tet, Aleph Yud, Aleph Kaf, Aleph Lamed, Aleph Mem, Aleph Nun, Aleph Samek, Aleph Ayan, Aleph Pe. Aleph Zadi, Aleph Kuf, Aleph Resh, Aleph Shin, Aleph Tav. Bet Gimel, Bet Dalit, Bet He, Bet Vav, Bet Zion, Bet Het, Bet Tet, Bet Yud, Bet Kaf, Bet Lamed, Bet Mem, Bet Nun, Bet Samach. Bet Ayan, Bet Pei, Bet Zadi, Bet Kuf, Bet Resh, Bet Shin, Bet Tav. Gimel Dalit, Gimel He, Gimel Vav, Gimel Zion, Gimel Chet, Gimel Tet, Gimel Yud, Gimel Kaf, Gimel Lamed, Gimel Mem, Gimel Nun, Gimel Samach, Gimel Ayan, Gimel Pei. Gimel Zadi, Gimel Kuf, Gimel Resh, Gimel Shin, Gimel Tav. Dalet He, Dalet Vav, Dalet Zion, Dalet Chet, Dalet Tet, Dalet Yud, Dalet Kaf, Dalet Lamed, Dalet Mem, Dalet Nun, Dalet Samach, Dalet Ayan, Dalet Pe, Dalet Zadi, Dalet Kuf, Dalet Resh. Dalet Shin, Dalet Tav. He Vav, He Zion, He Chet, He Tet, He Yud, He Kaf, He Lamed, He Mem, He Nun, He Samak, He Ayan, He Pe, He Zari, He Kuf, He Resh, He Shin, He Tav. Vav Zion, Vav Chet, Vav Tet, Vav Yud, Vav Kaf, Vav Lamed, Vav Mem, Vav Nun, Vav Samak, Vav Ayan, Vav Pe, Vav Zadi, Vav Kuf, Vav Resh, Vav Shin, Vav Tav. Zion Chet, Zion Tet, Zion Yud, Zion Kaf, Zion Lamed. Zion Mem, Zion Nun, Zion Samak, Zion Ayan, Zion Pe, Zion Zadi, Zion Kuf, Zion Resh, Zion Shin, Zion Tav. Het Tet, Het Yud, Het Kaf, Het Lamet, Het Mem, Het Nun, Het Samak, Het Ayan, Het Pe, Het Zadi, Het Kuf, Het Resh. Het Shin, Het Tav. Tet Yud, Tet Kaf, Tet Lamed, Tet Mem, Tet Nun, Tet Samach, Tet Ayan, Tet Pe, Tet Zari, Tet Kuf, Tet Resh, Tet Shin, Tet Tav. Yud Kaf, Yud Lamed, Yud Mem, Yud Nun, Yud Samach, Yud Ayan. Yud Pei, Yud Zadi, Yud Kuf, Yud Resh, 
Yud Shin, Yud Tav, Kaf Lamed, Kaf Mem, Kaf Nun, Kaf Samach, Kaf Ayin, Kaf Pe, Kaf Zadi, Kaf Kuf, Kaf Resh, Kaf Shin, Kaf Tav, Lamed Mem, Lamed Nun, Lamed Samach, Lamed Ayin, Lamed Pe, Lamed Zadi, Lamed Kuf, Lamed Resh, Lamed Shin, Lamed Tav. Mem Nun, Mem Samech, Mem Ayin, Mem Pe, Mem Zadi, Mem Kuf, Mem Resh, Mem Shin, Mem Tav. Nun Samech, Nun Ayin, Nun Pe, Nun Zadi, Nun Kuf, Nun Resh, Nun Shin, Nun Tav. Samak ayin, samak pe, samak zadi, samak kuf, samak resh, samak shin, samak tav. Ayin pe, ayin zadi, ayin kuf, ayin resh, ayin shin, ayin tav. Pe zadi, pe kuf, pe resh, pe shin, pe tav. Zadi kuf, zadi resh, zadi shin, zadi tav. Kuf resh, kuf shin, kuf tav. Resh shin, resh tav. Shin tav. If you're interested in working with the 231 Gates Meditation after the teleconference, here are some resources, the Kabbalah issue of the Rosicrucian Digest. And if you go to um, rosicrucian.org podcast, the 231 Gates Meditation, and you can find a video on youtube.com slash Rosicrucian TV. There are other Kabbalistic mandalas, including this one, which is the 72 names of the divine. Some of you may be familiar with the work of Hildegard of Bingen, who lived, she was a German mystic who lived from 1098 to 1179. She was a composer and a philosopher and a visionary. She was the 10th child in her family. And at this time in history, the 10th child was given to the church. And so she was sent to a cloistered convent at the age of eight. And at a very young age, she began having visions. And um, these were visions of very powerful transformative light, but she didn't share this until later in her life. And eventually she became the abbess of the convent where she lived. And she was extremely well-regarded as a mystic. And she, her music continues till today. And she had others draw the images that she had seen in her visions. This one is known, uh, is called Know the Ways of the Lord. And after 10 years, she put together these descriptions of visions and had someone draw the visions that, um, that described her mystical experiences. This one is the great span of the universe. It revealed itself to her in a trance as round and shadowy, pointed at the top like an egg, its outermost layer of a bright light. And in this mandala, that is 
Hildegard of Bingen down at the bottom left, and she's had this vision. This is a sphere spherical earth with different seasons at the same time. And she described her concept of veriditas, which is the greening. And it was as an agent of the divine, a divine vitality that was the animating life force within all creation. And for her, this greenness was the very expression of divine power on earth, the green force of life expanding into the universe. There are also many alchemical mandalas and John Dee was an English astronomer, astrologer, mathematician, an alchemist, a Rosicrucian, and he was the court astronomer and advisor for Elizabeth I. He created this mandala, which is called the Seal of the Divine, and it has a heptagram, which has seven sides. This is a magical formula for transformation. Dee worked a lot with images and with mandalas, and his glyph that we see here is called the Monas Hieroglyphica, and it embodies John Dee's vision of the unity of the cosmos and is a composite of various esoteric and astrological symbols. And like the word, there, the Sanskrit word written Aum or Hebrew letters, this glyph, it's believed that if we meditate on it properly, that we can achieve enlightenment or in the alchemist's view, the philosopher's stone. And this was in the Rosicrucian manifesto, the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz. This image is actually beside the royal wedding invitation in that Rosicrucian manifesto. And here it's broken down. He said that the symbol described not only the exact interrelationship of the planetary energies, but also showed the way to the transmutation of the metals, as well as the spiritual transformation of the alchemist. His symbol was the true philosopher's stone. Many of you are familiar with Dennis William Hauck, our frauder, who is the leading alchemist in the world. And in Rosicrucian Digest number one in 2013, he wrote an article, The Philosopher's Stone, which shares a lot about this image and the work of alchem alchemical meditation. Again, in the Rosicrucian Digest 2013, number one, the article by Dennis Howe called The Philosopher's Stone. Michael Meyer, um, an ardent defender of the Rosicrucians at the time that the Rosicrucian manifestos came out in the early 1600s, was an alchemist, an author, and the personal physician to Rudolf II, the um, emperor in Prague who surrounded himself with mystics. It was called the magical circle of Rudolf II. And Michael Meyer was very influential in that group. Early in his medical career, he witnessed a miraculous cure through the use of Paracelsian medicinal alchemy. And this changed his life forever. He later became a devout alchemist and, um, and Rosicrucian. He wrote a book called Antalanta Fugians. And uh, it is a book that has 50 emblems, each accompanied by a discourse and an epigram in verse set to music in the form of a fugue for three voices that tell the story of uh, Antalanta Fugians, which means uh, Antalanta uh, uh, fleeing. And it was the music, the songs were meant to be sung while working in an alchemical laboratory. And this is epigram number 21, and you can see the mandala there. This is, um, above this, it says, around, or, or, 
above this, um, there's an epigram related with this image and it says, around the man and woman draw a ring from which an equal sided square springs forth. You can see in his right hand, the pointer is going to the circle and the square. So he is squaring the circle. From which an equal sided square springs forth. From this derive a triangle. See the triangle that then goes above the square, which should touch the sphere on every side, and then the stone will have arisen. If this is not clear, then learn geometry and know it all. And this is about the reconciliation of opposites, the man and woman alchemically join as hermaphrodites. And this is related to the uh, son, the, the, the child of Hermes and Aphrodite, with, who was hermaphrodite. And this is the combination of the masculine and the feminine and the divine and the mundane. And this is how you produce the philosopher's stone in alchemy. And the squaring of the circle indicates the marriage of above and below. And emblem number 21, this one, you can go online and find the music and look at each of the 50 emblems, read the epigrams, and listen to the music, which again was intended to be sung in a laboratory doing alchemical work. Now we're going to look at mandalas of the traditional Martinist order. This is Jakob Burma, who lived from 1575 to 1624. He was a German mystic and the spiritual teacher of Louis Claude de Saint Martin of Martinism. Burma lived 100 years before Louis Claude de Saint Martin, but Saint Martin was so inspired by his work that when he was a little more than 40 years old, Saint Martin learned German so that he could study the work of Burma in his original language. Louis Claude de Saint Martin was French. And this is the frontispiece to Jakob Burma's work called Theosophical Works, which was published in 1682. And this version is hand colored by, it was hand colored um, in modern times by Adam McLean, who gave us permission to use this image on the cover of the TMO's official magazine, The Panticle in 2018. And we've reproduced on the cover of The Panticle many of Jakob Burma's uh, mystical mandalas. This image is very important to Martinist. It's called the Panticle. And I invite you now to meditate on this image for a few minutes. I'm not going to give you an explanation of the symbols. I just ask you again to sit comfortably and let your eyes go so relaxed that they may even become a little bit out of focus and your eyelids might start to go a little bit closed and just for a few moments, place your gaze on this image. And we'll move on now. Now we're going to look at some Rosicrucian mandalas. I mentioned earlier that H. Spencer Lewis reproduced the secret symbols of the Rosicrucians. It's an oversized book. 
And these are images from the 16th and 17th centuries, Rosicrucian images, symbols. And on the right is from the page that H. Spencer Lewis hand colored. Every member was encouraged to color it in the, the way that they were inspired to do. It didn't have to be the same colors that H. Spencer Lewis did. This image is the vitriol image. If you read the Latin around from the top where it says visita, it's visita interiora terre rectificando in vienes occultum lapidum. And in English, this means visit the interior of earth and through rectification, which means either purification or correction or to set right, you will find the hidden stone. So this is a formula to find the philosopher's stone in spiritual alchemy. Visit the interior of earth and through rectification, you will find the hidden stone. In chemistry, vitriol is iron or copper sulfate salts and their derivative sulfuric acid, which is used in alchemical processes. The name comes from the Latin for glassy, after the resemblance of iron sulfate to shards of green glass. Vitriol is symbolized alchemically as the green lion a poisonous substance that appears when metal is degrade, degraded by acid. And you can see the green lion in that image. Sulfuric acid or oil of vitriol was used in the synthesis of the Lapis Philosophorum, the philosopher's stone. One unique property of sulfuric acid is the dissolution of metals, all except for gold on which it has no effect. And here is this image again. This mandala is another ancient Rosicrucian symbol. It's called Azoth of the Philosophers. And just gaze upon this image while I describe some of the symbols. And in a later issue of the Rosicrucian Digest, we published, it's the one that uh, focused on the chemical wedding of Christian Rosenkreutz in 2014. We have an article and a recording, again by Dennis Hauck, that is a meditation on this image. And I'm gonna share just a little bit of the information from that meditation. This emblem was created by the 15th century monk Basil Valentine, and it shows the operation of alchemy as rays on a star of transformation, at the center of which is the alchemist. The large triangle behind the ring stands for the three forces of creation, which, are, which we know today as matter, energy, and light. Alchemists though refer to them as the three essentials of salt, sulfur, and mercury. The, the, at the bottom of the work, the quintessence is trapped in black matter and is raised through the purifying processes of alchemy to become the winged angel, the ascended essence at the very top. In the background on the left and right can be see the opposing forces of king and queen spirit and soul that are united in the work. In the circles between the rays that come out from the face of the alchemist in the center, we see that at the beginning there is just one bird which does not discover it has a soul until the second operation reveals it. And afterwards, the birds of soul and spirit work together. And as you can see, the outer ring again says, Visit the interior of earth, and through rectification, you will find the hidden stone. Vitriol. If you take the first letter of each of those words, it spells out vitriol, 
sulfuric acid. Alchemists believe a similar liquid fire exists within themselves and call it their secret fire for spiritual alchemy. And when meditating upon this image, we start with the face at the center and realize that we are now the alchemist. And again, I encourage you to practice this meditation being led with Dennis Houck's voice. If you uh, go to rosacrucian.org and digest and look at the 2014 issue that's dedicated to the chemical wedding. Well, excuse me, I said 2014 is 2016. 2016, number one. A labyrinth is also a mandala. And uh, a few weeks ago, Hugh McGaig presented a great presentation on journeying to the inner self, to the, the source. And as you know, a, a labyrinth is not a maze. We don't get lost. It's a meditative tool. So we, we, it's a, a, a tool for going within. This is an image from the Rosicrucian labyrinth at Rosicrucian Park standing in the center. So it's a walking meditation. And here's an image showing the labyrinth. It was a, uh, this is a, a drone photo showing the labyrinth from above next to the Rosicrucian Grand Temple with the solar panels on the roof. I'd like to come back to Erwin Watermeyer again, who talks about attuning with the master within. Our inner self is wiser than the outer. And when it speaks, it always tells us something which we objectively do not yet know. Hence, when symbols arise for our sub, from our subconscious, they always contain more than we know objectively at the moment. And it is then up to us through meditation and contemplation to discover what the master within wishes to tell us. So now we're going to open ourselves to what the master within wants to tell us by creating our own mandala. We're going to be squaring the circle. So we're going to start with a piece of paper that is in the shape of a square. And if you're in the US, a typical sheet of paper is eight and a half by 11. So you can just fold the top over, make it approximately two and a half inches, just fold it over so that the piece of paper that you have is approximately a square. It doesn't have to be an exact square. And now open yourself to your mandala, to what your master within wants to communicate to you right now. Have your paper handy, have some colored pencils or pens, or even just a, a regular pencil is fine. Now open yourself to what form your mandala is going to take. On the screen are some examples of what we've experienced today. You may choose to draw a sacred symbol in the center like the pentacle with the interlaced triangles or the word Aum. You can write it in English if you want, or maybe you'll put a tree in the center of your mandala. Or you may draw a circle around the center point of your square and then draw a horizontal line and a vertical line that cross in the center. So you've divided your page into four sections like we see with the uh, flag of New Mexico and some of the other we saw in the Navajo sand painting. Remember, the Zia Indians had four sacred obligations. Maybe as part of what will come from your master within, you'll explore their four sacred obligations. Development of a strong body, a clear mind, a pure spirit, 
and devotion to the welfare of others, which is service. Or you may have something else in mind for your mandala. Or you may draw a dot in the center of your page and draw concentric circles around that center dot, either with a compass or a ruler, or you could use a glass and then a saucer and then a plate making the circles larger. So decide how you'll create your mandala. Will this be a healing mandala with images of those who will help facilitate your healing? Will you destroy your mandala afterwards or give it to Mother Earth? Or will you keep it and place it in your sanctum? Now let's begin. For a few moments, focus on your breath. Just breathe normally. And focus on your breath as it enters and exits your nostrils. The best way to connect with our master within, with the subconscious is through our psychic centers. And in the very first cycle of Rosicrucian monographs, we're given a meditation for stimulating those psychic centers. And I can't share that here. That's for our Rosicrucian work in our sanctums. We will intone a vowel sound that helps to harmonize all the psychic centers. And this is the vowel sound tha, T-H-A, tha. We're going to intone that now three times. Ready? Inhale. Tha. Now have your square piece of paper handy and a pencil and open yourself to the message that your master within wants to communicate to you right now. As you're inspired, spend the next few minutes creating your mandala. Letting your master within or your subconscious mind reveal to you through your drawing. 